Hey guys, new disclaimer. I am not sure what's true or false in this video. I take gossip and tea from online, from magazines, from books, from word of mouth, from all over, and I ball it up together and I tell you guys a story. Now, let's get to the video. Hi everybody, this is Ashley with Ashley Says So, and I got a weave in right now, but y'all done seen my real hair. I have started using hair care products from Function of Beauty Baby. That is a vegan and cruelty free hair scalp and skin care designed by your own personal chemist. But Ashley, I'm white, that don't work for me. Or Ashley, I'm black, that don't, oh child, be quiet. You go online, you tell them folks what type of hair you have, what your hair goals are, and let them do the rest. Because I sure went on there and told them that I needed a shampoo and conditioner for wavy to straight hair, something that moisturizes my hair, and also something to help with split ends. Then I told them, don't be sending me no little basic off-white cream color stuff. And that's when they told me, baby, you can choose your own color. What is you talking about? And so I did. I chose a pink shampoo and a blue conditioner. Function of Beauty by Ashley Says. Yep, I got to name my product too. It's been extensively tested, never on animals though, and also been approved by dermatologists. My hair ain't dry and skippy no more, honey. It's full of shine and luscious. I have made it to where you can have the same experience. All you gotta do is click my link in the description box, subscribe, and you can get 20% off of your first 16 ounce custom set. When you click that link, there's one more thing I recommend too. Go ahead and become a member. Therefore, you can get good perks like free shipping. Member shout out to you got Annie Lee on Unlimited LLC, LaQuisha Richardson, Brother Artem, Crystal Michelle, Dana T, Jesui, I did? If I messed it up, I'm so sorry, baby. M.M. Born, Annie Graves, Victorious Melanin, Vera and Daye. Remember, if you are a member, do not worry, do not fret. I will continue to call names the further I go alone. Now, baby, it is time to get to the scandalous tea on the first black multimillionaire of the silver screen, honey. Mr. Lincoln Perry, a.k.a. Step and Fetch It. Let's get to it. Lincoln Theodore Monroe Andrew Perry was born on May 30th, 1902 in Key West, Florida. His mother's name was Dora Monroe and she was a seamstress and his father's name was Joseph Perry and he was a cigar maker. Now rumor has it that Lincoln's father was a very, very proud man, honey. He was loud and boastful and braggadocious. He was certainly full of confidence and he actually wanted to make it as a stage or film star himself. But per the rumor, he had a very nasty habit of doing a lot of that bragging and boasting in front of African Americans. Now it's claimed that he sort of looked down on us, okay? He would let us know with the quickness that he wasn't ever no white man slave. He also would say that he wasn't stupid and he sure enough wasn't lazy. He was a West Indian man, you know, so he had this kind of attitude of, you know, don't mix me with these regular blacks from over here in America. Baby, I'm from West India and all this good stuff. And while his father was doing the most, his wife was totally opposite. Now Dora was a proud woman, but she was that quiet proud, that dignified proud. In fact, she tried to retire her dignity and she saw theater and acting and things like that as a secular worldly thing. She also saw it as kind of lower class. She just wanted to become successful the regular way and fit in with the quiet middle class. And that's why when Lincoln used to be at the dinner table at night and humming and kind of patting his feet and patting his legs, his mother would be like, boy, you stop that. And then his father would be like, no, you stop that. Stop telling my son what to do. If he wants to do all that, nothing's wrong with that. And Dora being a woman and wife of her times would quite quiet down and follow her husband's lead. Now, although little Lincoln seemed to be like his father in his attitude and his ways, he absolutely adored his mother. He really treasured her and thought she was the most beautiful and kindest woman in this world. She was really his shining star. But the thing is, is that even though his mama was his shining star and beautiful and all this kind of stuff, child, that didn't stop little Lincoln from acting out and doing real crazy stuff. They say that boy was a stealing fool, child. I mean, just a kleptomaniac, girl. Said the boy would be talking to you in a conversation and steal the shoes right off your feet. Gossip say the boy was so bad at this, he would steal things that he didn't even need, stuff that he didn't even have a use for, and throw it away five minutes later. Honey, it's claimed that it got so bad that Lincoln got tired of himself. He wanted to stop himself from stealing. Baby, they said he would go to the church and he would get on his knees and pray, you know, please God, stop me from stealing. Please, I don't want to do this no more. And say, amen, get up, and steal the Bible out the back of the church pew on the way out the door. The boy had a problem, girl. Now, outside of Lincoln stealing all the time, his childhood seemed to be mostly normal. I do know that it's claimed that his mother had big aspirations of dentist. Those aspirations went to her son. She wanted little Lincoln to become a dentist. And it just so happened she was cleaning the house of a wealthy black dentist. While Dora worked there, she would invite her son Lincoln to come over. She just kind of wanted him to be in the dentist's presence. So maybe some of that stuff could rub off on him. And then something terrible happened. 
Dora ended up getting sick. And at first, the family thought it was a passing illness, but when it was clear that the illness was not going anywhere and that Dora most likely was going to pass away, she actually spoke to the dentist and his wife and she asked them to take her children in. She really just felt like Joseph's sporting ways and his flashy lifestyle. She just felt like he wasn't going to be stable enough to raise her children. And when I say children, it's because Lincoln also had two sisters. When Lincoln moved in with the dentist, it is said that he did start to act out a bit, but at first nobody really noticed it because all he started doing was stealing more. But it was getting way worse. See, not only was he stealing Bibles out of the back of church pews now, baby, now he had got so bold where he would sit in the service, wait for the offering plate to be passed around, put in 10 cent and pull out 50 cent. So Lincoln was a little bit out of control, but it is said that when he really sat back and examined his life, he was just kind of bored with this family. Yes, this family had made it. They were successful. They were wealthy, but they were quiet. You can't talk around the house. Can't nobody do nothing. Everybody got to walk in a straight line and all this kind of stuff. It just didn't fit him. Where was the fun? And because he felt this way, he kept on acting out. And then soon that dentist's family was kind of like fed up with him a little bit. So they sent him off to a school. And this was in 1916. And this is when Lincoln made two decisions that would alter his life forever. Let me tell you about the first one. So when Lincoln gets to the school, they start to give him odd jobs. And one of those jobs is to help the doctors in the school help wounded soldiers. So one day they had a man that came in and when they pulled off his shoe, they saw that his foot was getting gangrene because it had a wound on it. So the doctors chopped off the foot and they handed it to Lincoln and they told him to take the foot and put it in the incinerator. Lincoln does take the foot, but when he gets to the incinerator, he pulls out a pocket knife and cuts off the big toe of the foot. Then his crazy tail went around the school where the younger students were, whispered them over and I got something in my pocket. It's a secret. Y'all gonna like this. Come and look at it. Come and look at it. And when they got close to his pocket, he would pull out the rotten toe and chase these kids around and they all running, you know, ah, because they scared. And supposedly he got away with this for a few days before somebody really told on him. And when they did, they went and grabbed his little stinking tail up and took his little behind to the office. And yes, he was stinking because they said that toe was stinking. Anyway, it was decided that Lincoln would be dismissed from the school. But one of the teachers started to fight for him and she tried to get him reinstated in the school, but Lincoln didn't want to go back because he was very embarrassed. And he also was too embarrassed to go back home. So this is when Lincoln made the second decision that would alter his life forever. And that is when a circus came to town, Lincoln took off running and joined that circus. And sources differ on his age, but a lot of sources think he was 12, then others say he was 14. So while Lincoln was with this carnival, one of the first stops they made was Montgomery, Alabama, and it was there that he worked with a medicine man, and Lincoln was the pitch man. You know, he would get on stage and dance and draw a crowd, and then of course the snake oil salesman medicine man would throw out his medicine to the crowd, you know, heal your arm and all that good stuff. After that, he started working with a plantation show called Diamond Tooth, and that was owned by a man named Billy Ornty. In this show, Lincoln was billed as a person named Rastus and he was a buck dancer. But Billy Ornty felt like he could put hands on Lincoln whenever he wanted to. So he was always pushing him around and then he started throwing things at him, like throwing bottles at him and stuff whenever he was angry or whenever he wanted to fuss at Lincoln. But Lincoln was like, uh, do you know who my daddy is? Boy, I'm not gonna sit up there and let you push around on me and hit on me. So he ended up quitting the show. Then child, listen at this cause it's finna get strange. So Lincoln had quit, like I said, but he still spent the night in his tent until he can get somewhere else. So while he was sleeping during the night, he started hearing these sounds. And then he wakes up and he sees two white globes just floating in front of him. So of course he jumps up like, what's going on? You know, he's scared. Then he starts to settle down and he also starts to smile because he starts to notice that these two white globes got pink nipples. And what's done happen is Billy Ornty and sent his wife in there naked trying to sleep with Lincoln to lure him back to the show because Billy Ornty understood that Lincoln Perry was bringing him a lot of money. But see, the wife and Billy was looking stupid because per Lincoln, he said no. He jumped away from that woman and he still quit the show. But child, what if Lincoln was lying? What if he sat up there and slept with that woman anyway? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, baby, I get back in the show. And then next thing you know, he done sat up there and got up and left before daybreak. <laughs> But if he did, that's what Billy get. Whatever the case, in the end, he did leave. And on his journey of kind of being by himself, he did a lot of things to survive. You know, he was a stable boy, the boot black. He was a laborer. He did a whole bunch of stuff. And then after touring with all these traveling shows in his teens, by the time he turned 20, he was doing black theater shows. And this was doing well for him in some ways because he was getting all kind of experience, but he was just starting out. So he was not getting any money. Baby, the boy was broke as a joke. And the reason why is because he was dealing with Toba. Theater owners, 
Booking Association. And what this Toba would do is book Lincoln as well as other black stars, and then after they perform, pay them either nothing or just half of what they promised them. They would come back and be like, oh, you know, well, you didn't fill the whole house up. But majority of the time, the whole house was filled. So they had to come up with another excuse. And then they started saying this mess right here because this is some real BS. They started saying, oh, well, you know, the full house was full and all this kind of stuff, but the folks wasn't really laughing for real. You know what I'm saying? I expected every face in the house to be laughing. So I saw about 10 folks. Them folks wasn't laughing. So in that case, we cannot pay you the full thing. Here, do you want this half or you ain't getting nothing? So it will really set these black actors and actresses back. But of course, at that time, in the late 1910s, early 1920s, this is all the black actors and actresses. This is all they could really do. Then one day, he just threw up his hands. This was very early on. He said he had quit show business. So he went back to be a preacher. A few months later, child, he told them church folks deuces, baby. Told them folks that he wasn't even making enough money to live as a preacher. And so he had to do something else. And so when he went back to the Chitlin circuit and to Toba this time, it is claimed that this is around the time that Lincoln actually got the name Step and Fetch It. It said that after a show that he actually had been paid well for, he went and started to gamble on a horse. Said that he lost everything, child. Was down to the clothes on his back and he still gamble for that and gossip says that the horse that he betted on was named step and fetch it and of course that horse won so lincoln perry looked at that like that was a great omen and it is claimed that that is when he took his stage name but i also want to make clear that it is said that he was not actually just step and fetch it by himself at first he did supposedly get the name from a racehorse but he was step and another person he was performing with was fetch it and something about they had a show they had to perform and fetch it could not make it so step had to go on stage alone and and I guess he didn't like to be called just Step or something like that. So that's when he took on the full name, Step and Fetch It. Whatever the case, once he named himself Step and Fetch It, he actually had come up with a character, a personality. He was getting rave reviews and he was starting to make a lot more money than what he was paid before. He is also doing journalist work and he is writing columns in black newspapers and he's doing very well at that and getting paid for that as well. Then something happened. Black Broadway had arrived and it was really doing its thing. Shows like Shuffle Alone, things like that. When shows like this started happening, Black Broadway was the place to be. And on top of that, you had Fats Waller, you had Duke Ellington, you had Cap Calloway. All of these people were making a name for him Himself, it was a trendy time for black people and Lincoln wanted to make sure he rode that wave So sooner or later he booked his way over to the East Coast and started appearing in New York And it was here that he perfected his character. This is when he made his face a little longer You know what I'm saying? He also blinked his eyes either really fast or very slow and then his voice wasn't really deep It was just you know, yeah, yes, yeah, sir, and then I went down there and uh, the boss said, you know, I can't do it like him, but that's the type of um, performance that he was giving. This new character became so popular that he became an in-demand actor. Baby, when the man wasn't getting paid just like a year ago, honey, this man was now making $100 per week. Then in May of 1927, Lincoln was like, you know, why don't I give LA a chance? I want to be in the films. I really want to give films a try. The first thing he did was go to some black movie directors and ask to be in their films. And these films were not blockbusters or anything like that, but they were a very nice change of pace for him because he was able to showcase his wonderful talent on a grander scale. And of course, talent like that is not overlooked, not in the least, honey. So soon, white directors started calling him and wanting him to appear in their film. And Lincoln knew this was where the money was at, so honey, soon as he got in the door, he started showing his Tell. I mean, he started doing some of the best work that he had ever done. And yes, it is true that he slowed his character down a lot more than it already was. He made himself appear very, very dumb and slow, way more than he had already done. But hey, this is what the white filmmakers were looking for. And so Lincoln felt like, hey, I'm good at it. So let me go ahead and be my very best at it. And when he did, the audiences ate it up. They're like, golly, you know, look at this guy. He's really, really slow. Look how lazy he is. I mean, he sleep all the time. He's scratching his head. Look how dumb he is. It was just... They hadn't seen anything like that before, not to the level where Lincoln Perry step and fetch it was doing it. And so naturally, they wanted more and more of this guy, and casting directors started calling Lincoln left and right. And since he was being cast a lot more, 
Lincoln understood that his star power was growing and the boy wasn't no fool, he wasn't stupid. So he understood that with my star power growing, I should be paid a little bit more money because see, at the time he was only making $100 per week. The same thing he was making on the theater circuit. And rumor has it that Lincoln Perry was a shrewd businessman when it came to what he was making, what he was receiving. Now he definitely wasn't that way over what he was spending, but when it came to what he was making, his pay, he was a shrewd businessman, baby. And because of this, he wasn't cowering in no corner, scared to ask for money, you know, how am I gonna say this, how am I gonna, no, no ma'am. He walked right into the office and he demanded more money. And baby, Lincoln knew he was a good negotiator, but he didn't know he was that good, cause honey, he surprised himself when he walked out of that studio with a contract for $2,500 a week. This is the 1920s, baby. Folks ain't even making $2,500 a week today. And the reason they offered him this type of money is because they knew, just like Lincoln knew, that he was quickly on his way to becoming a household name. No, that name would have not been Lincoln Perry, but it most definitely would have been Step and Fetch. And so, honey, after this, Lincoln Perry is riding his train to glory, honey. I mean, he is really doing it, baby. And honey, you know some scandalous, messy tales happened along the way. And baby, we about to start from the bottom too, child. I've already told y'all how messy Lincoln Perry was as a child, but child, listen to this story. So as a child, he was attending church with a friend. Now some rumors say he was an altar boy. I don't know nothing about that. All I know is that he was sitting in church and he wanted to let out some silent gas. So honey, he got the leaning over, you know what I'm saying? Lifting up that leg a little bit and opening that booty cheek a little bit too. And girl blew the whole church away, honey. I'm talking about just a <laughs> poop was so loud and stinking that the pastor came out the pulpit, honey. That pastor walked right up to Lincoln and he was wondering, why would you disrupt service in that way? And child, the folks say Lincoln didn't miss a beat, baby. Sat up there and looked at that pastor dead in his eye and started shaking his head and said, not me, and pointed to the man behind him. Girl embarrassed that man so bad. Said it was an old man child, hair and beard just full of gray. Baby, that pastor was so livid that he and his church members was choked up and couldn't breathe because of the funk, honey. Baby, he put Lincoln and that old man out of the church. Put him on probation, girl. Now let's get to these next rumors, honey. And these rumors are about how Lincoln Perry started acting once he became a big time film star. Honey, the folks say he started acting like the biggest man around town. Started acting like he ain't never seen money before too. Wearing the biggest, flashiest clothes, all of this jewelry, all of these nice fine hats. And own almost every single limited edition luxury car. The man had some high expensive taste for sure. If he liked it, he was going to buy it and there was no exception. And pretty soon he was spending way more than what he was making. But you think that stopped him? Not at all, baby. He felt like if he wanted to spend more than what he was making, then honey, he should be making a little bit more. So he walked himself right into the studio head's office and demanded more money. But these studio heads were not buying that. And they told him to get his little tail out of their office. And Lincoln got out for the moment. But he came back a week later and walked back in that office again and said, hey, listen, my entertainment lawyer, Mr. Goldberg, told me that I am not acting for you guys anymore unless you bring my contract up and pay me more money. And when he said this, those studio heads started singing a new tune. See, they ain't have no extra money to just get to a black man, you know. But see, now that he had a white Jewish representative behind him, oh, all of a sudden they started finding money from anywhere. And it's claimed that he walked out of there either making $3,000 a week or possibly even $3,500 a week. But girl, didn't I tell you that Lincoln Perry was a shrewd businessman when it came down to his money? But no, Mr. Goldberg. Mr. Goldberg was a figment of his imagination. And he had fooled those studio heads like it wasn't nothing. But it didn't matter none, honey, because see, now Mr. Lincoln Perry, aka Step and Fetch It, was the highest paid black man or highest paid black person, period, in show business. And like I said before, he acted like it. And baby, you better believe he did. Lincoln Perry went to every party in town, honey, buying everybody drink, had the flyers clothes, and always left every night with at least three women on his own. But pause, I shouldn't say women because gossip claims that these were girls. We'll get to that more in a minute. He also had a habit of throwing his money in people's faces. He was very much one of those guys that was like, Negro, what you say to me? 
Mother Effa, it's a car sitting out there, $10,000. Mother Effa, can you buy that? And also, a lot of those cars he bought were very fast cars, so he had a big problem with speeding, just like his best friend, Jack Johnson, and racked up speeding tickets like it wasn't nothing. Baby, his driving record was worse than mine, and I got 11 tickets. So you know he had to be doing the most. Lincoln Perry was hell, honey, especially in the studio. See, now he knew how much he was worth. So baby, he started showing up when he wanted to. And he also talked to people the way he wanted to. Then he started being real reckless, y'all. Like if he'd rather spend his time with a woman or spend a night with a woman, he just called in and said he was sick, wasting the studio's money. Let me tell you just how bad he was acting. Let me give you an example. So one day he is filming a movie. He's on the set, he's filming, and he has a head full of hair. So they say cut everybody goes home Lincoln goes and gets a haircut shaves his head bald baby they've already shot like five or six scenes the day before with a head full of hair sir they cannot continue with your head bald headed comes back the next day to resume filming the studio head was furious people just scrambling they trying to find some kinky wigs you know what I'm saying they plucking off the wigs and trying to glue it to his head it was bad, y'all. Rumor also has it that he had a problem with trying to prove himself. He would try to prove his wealth. Because, see, the studio heads knew what he was making, but the other actors and actresses did not. So Lincoln had to show them. So he would do things like drive his new exotic car onto the studio lot at 50 miles per hour, about to run over the other actors and actresses. Then when he pulled out his luxury cars to come to the set, oh, he always had his chauffeur to drive him to the set. Once they park, they have to get out the car and they run around and open Lincoln's door and it's nothing wrong with that. But hey, baby, he's not gonna put his foot on the ground when he steps out of the car. You need to put a footstool down so Mr. Lincoln can step on that footstool and then step on the ground. And if you think that is something, here is something that's going to take the cake. So step and fetch it, Lincoln Perry has two Cadillacs. He would drive to the studio with both Cadillacs, honey. He would be sitting in the back seat of the front one and just have somebody else drive the back one to the studio. So that's just the gist of kind of how he was acting. Now let's get back to the lady. Lincoln Perry was not half stepping at all, but he was definitely half aging because gossip says that his main things were high yellow 16 year old showgirl of course he would continue to sleep with 17 18 19 maybe even 20 but it's claimed that his choice was 16 year old girl now from what gossip says is that most of these showgirls came up to new york or came up to Los Angeles from small towns. They would dance in clubs like the Cotton Club and the Apex and clubs like that. And when Lincoln stepped into these clubs with all of his flashy clothes, you know, in his nice car, he would have his pick of these ladies because they were really just poor girls. You hear you had a man that was an obvious movie star. Yes, they were trying to get with him because they were hoping for a better life. And even in his day and age, gossip would get around Hollywood circles or at least the black entertainer circles that Step and Fetch It is messing around with a lot of these young girl and he even caused a stir a little bit when he ended up marrying a 17 year old Dorothy Stevenson but we're gonna get to that in just a bit right now we're gonna talk about one of the big time names he dated honey and that was Miss Nina Mae McKinney yes honey Miss Nina Mae McKinney was at that time quickly becoming a household name herself. In fact, she had just starred in one of the top black movies, which was Hallelujah, and Lincoln Perry had starred in one of the top black movies, which was like the Hearts of Dixie or something like that. But anyways, Dixie and um, Hallelujah, they came out at the same time. So all of a sudden, it catapulted these two into like the black Hollywood star people. And since one was male and one was female, they felt like it was only right that the king and queen of black Hollywood get together and become a couple. And they were correct, black journalism exploded when they got together. I mean, they really, really were the Beyonce and Jay-Z of their time. And it seems like that relationship should have lasted. You know what I'm saying? These two black Hollywood stars, but unfortunately there was a downside to their relationship. They might've looked like J and B, but really on the inside, they were more like Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, making hot, passionate love in one instant and strangling each other in the next instant. Child of folks on the streets say that them two would bop each other on the head all the time. And no, it never turned into like really beating on each other like you know what I'm saying black eyes or anything like that but it was still still volatile and they were the talk of black Hollywood as well as some circles in white Hollywood especially when Nina May went to the newspapers and told everybody that Lincoln Perry had proposed to her and she had to cut off the engagement because she said that he did not save any money their engagement was off but it's claimed they still had some few dealings with each other but over time it actually did kind of wear away it didn't last that much longer now after their relationship ended 
did. Lincoln may have hated it a little bit, but he didn't really have time, honey. He had other women that he had to tend to. One of those women, I guess, was a girl named Yvonne Butler, and she was probably like 15, 16 years old. And Yvonne Butler was a chorus girl and a beauty contest winner who had come to Hollywood to try her fortune. And as soon as she got to Hollywood, she could not believe her luck when one of the first men to show her any attention or to glide up in her face was Lincoln Perry. Lincoln was happy to have something new and fresh on his arm. And because those showgirls he had been messing with, I hate to say it, but Gossip says a lot of them were kind of pass arounds. You know what I'm saying? And they had been with other men. This was somebody that had not been with anybody. She had just arrived, so he definitely was whining and dining her. He was not afraid to be seen outside with her, taking her to nice restaurants, shopping, a whole bunch of stuff. It was really like Yvonne was everything that he wanted and needed, so he delighted her when one day he came and promised her that he would marry her. So this young girl was in a whirlwind of love, lust, and money. She was dizzy with Lincoln's affections, and Lincoln was dizzy too, until one day, he wasn't. Seriously. Just one day, Lincoln Perry was not interested in Yvonne Butler anymore. Baby, she could have faded into a black screen for all he cared. And you know why? child Dorothy Stevenson honey this siren of a teenage girl had caught his eye and Dorothy Stevenson wasn't really trying to be a siren she just was so beautiful to Lincoln that she was a very hot flaming siren and she and Lincoln dated for only a few months before he married her and so now word was spreading about Lincoln Perry and his new beautiful young wife so yes gossip was very much entertaining her age but that didn't even have times to make full rounds before something else set tongues aflame. I mean, set them on fire, honey. And that was when Yvonne Butler went to the law and the newspapers telling them that she was suing Lincoln Perry for $100,000 because of a breach of a promise to marry her. And when people saw this, oh honey, Lincoln Perry was the talk of the town. And I'm talking about the whole U.S. See, his other stuff was just kind of Hollywood circle. This girl had went to the newspaper. So now people worldwide was able to see just the type of man he was. And a lot of people did not like it because what it showed him to be was a cad. You know what I'm saying? And not only was he a cad and a cheater and playing these folks, he was playing very young girls. This girl, Yvonne Butler, was so young that when it came time for her to go to court, she had to bring her mother with her as a representative to go to court over this issue. So yes, a lot of his fans did not like that. They really started to see Lincoln Perry as a grown man who hits up these young girls for their honey pot and as soon as something new or fresh or better comes along, he leaves them high and dry. Now in the end, Yvonne Butler did win her suit but she only got $5,000. And I think also in the end, Lincoln only ended up paying $2,500 of the $5,000. But it did not matter. It did not matter how much money he paid or how much money he got away with or whatever. The damage was already starting because once people worldwide started to know this, people started digging more and more and trying to see just what this step and fetch it or Lincoln Perry guy was about. And they did not like what they saw. One of the things they found out is that he had a raging attitude. He was always somewhere getting into a a fight and this leads me into my next rumor when Lincoln Perry got into an all-out brawl with John Bubbles Sublet. So how it happened is that they were all at a party okay and Lincoln had come with his new fiance at that time Dorothy Stevens and he went over to his buddy Bubbles and he was like hey man you see this new thing on my arm boy you couldn't draw her away from me if you wanted to she hooked on me and so Bubbles was like oh okay you know cool so Lincoln was like hey what I want you to do is I want you to go over there go on over there you know Bubbles try to holler you know what I'm saying? Flatter her and see what she do. Man, I bet you she turned you down. So Bubbles goes over there. Hey, Miss Lady, I seen you from across the room. Hey, man, I say you looking stunning tonight. And pop, baby child, then got bust outside the back of the head, honey, with a bottle, child. Lincoln Perrin sat over there and got jealous, child. Talking about some, you laying it on a little too thick. What you doing? This my woman. It gets so bad that people start to think that they're going to shoot. So everybody starts running outside of the house. And before long, as Bubbles and Lincoln are fighting, they also end up outside of the house. But Bubbles could never really get himself together because he just got hit upside the head with a bottle. So he takes off running down the road. And then Lincoln Perry starts to run after him. Lincoln gets tired. And while he's running, he hollers to his chauffeur, Hey, come pick me up. We finna hunt this dude down. Like, come get me. So the chauffeur drives up picks him up and they go and they're driving right beside uh bubbles and then lincoln perry starts taking liquor bottles and like throwing them at them and you know just doing all kind of stuff it was really a big mess and when the press got a hold to it it was really really bad press 
for Lincoln Perry. This next rumor is about the time that Dorothy Stevenson and Lincoln Perry gets into an argument, but Dorothy Stevenson's brother is at the house as well. So he's sitting back watching them argue, but then Lincoln Perry, I guess, says something that upsets him. So he stands up like, hey, you ain't finna be talking to my sister like this. I don't know who you think you is, but this ain't finna happen. And then he turns around to Dorothy and he's like, hey sis, you don't have to take this. You're better than a pop child and got bust upside the head with a metal pipe child. So like I said, Lincoln Perry is just doing things. He's just out of control. And why is he busting everybody upside the head? And then along with the press about all these fights and stuff, he started to get press about his bad driving habit. There's this story where he was like speeding and swerving and he was pulled over and he was found to be drunk. Well, his excuse to the police was is that yes, he was drunk. And he said that the reason he drank so much during the night is because when he got to the studio the next morning, he had to play a really sleepy character, you know, because his character was was always sleepy and couldn't talk and drowsy and all that good stuff so he said he had to have his beers at night that's the only way he can really stay sleepy and get into character this is also the story that he told the jury and the judge when he went to court for this and Lincoln Perry was still a superstar so the jury laughed at him and they also bought his excuse so he got off but this is how cocky he was let's not cocky he was though as soon as he knew that he was about to be acquitted I guess as soon as he heard the people say in for not guilty or whatever this him <sighs> So the newspapers later printed that, oh my gosh, the laziest man alive, he was so lazy when they acquitted him in the court, they had to wake him up because he was asleep again. Then, not even a couple of years after this episode, Step and Fetcher was in a car accident again, and this one was a very, very bad car accident. So bad that his passenger, Daddy Lane, whom also was a veteran actor, ended up having to go to the hospital afterwards. They released him from the hospital two days later. Well, the man ended up dying from things that happened to him while he was in that car wreck. And when they brought him back to the hospital, they noticed that he actually had broken ribs, you know. I think something was wrong with his sternum. So the hospital had overlooked a lot of stuff. Now, Step and Fetch it was not blamed. The law did not blame him for this. But the only reason that he was not blamed is because if they blamed him, they would have also had to lay some blame on the hospital. The hospital overlooked these injuries and sent this man home? Oh yeah, if you was gonna blame Lincoln Perry, you also had to hold the hospital accountable. And of course, they weren't about to do that, so they just kind of quietly dropped the whole thing. And then he was getting even worse at the studios. There was this one time he was supposed to be shooting a picture somewhere, and they told him to stay on location. Chai, after the first week of filming, uh, Lincoln got bored, and he went and left and went to Annapolis, I do believe. Did a whole bunch of gambling, sleeping with a whole bunch of women, spent all his money had to call the studio head the day that they were starting to shoot and tell him, hey, I, I didn't spend up all my money down here. If y'all want me in the movie, you need to pay my way to get back. And the studio head, of course, paid the way, but he was furious. And if I'm not mistaken, it was actually this right here that caused Fox to finally drop him from the contract. But Lincoln Perry was not worried about it because Harry Cunn over at Columbia offered him a contract. Now, people are said to have talked to both Lincoln and Harry Cunn and had told them, you know, hey, we don't think this is a good idea. You know, Harry, you expect everything to go your way. Lincoln Perry is not the kind of guy to just bend to your rules. But Harry Cunn said, I feel like I can be the one to straighten him out. Baby, Lincoln Perry ain't lasted three days in that doggone contract before he was tossed out. But even after this, there were other studios that tried to work with Lincoln Perry, but he would not stop his bad behavior. He would not stop bursting into the studio head's office, you know, demanding that he have better pay or demanding, you know, oh, I saw that white actor over there with that leather coat y'all and gave him where my leather coat is. And a lot of these studio heads did not feel obliged to do anything extra for him. They definitely didn't feel obliged to treat him or pay him on the same level as a white star because they felt like black movies didn't bring in that much revenue anyway. They felt like they had given him enough. And this is the thing. People like to say that uh, Lincoln Perry step and fetch it made over a million dollars. But see, gossip says that Lincoln Perry actually made over two million dollars. That's how well paid he was. And all of this gossip, all of these tales that I have told you, all of this happened in the late 1920s, early 1930s. See, what a lot of people don't know is that Lincoln Perry had two careers in Hollywood, just like Joan Crawford. So this is all the first career, all right? So right now, at this moment, we are getting to like 1931, 1932. Hollywood starts to wind down on Lincoln Perry. They feel like he's doing too much. Nobody wants to take a chance on him. He's too difficult. 
difficult. Now, Lincoln on the outside acts like he doesn't care, you know what I'm saying? He got all this pride and all this good stuff, but on the inside, he is definitely quivering because you're going from making $3,500 a week to nothing. So he did have a plan. He went back to vaudeville in the theater, but it did not work out as well as he really wanted it to because see, what he did not understand is that he had messed up with some black folk too. Like I said, a lot of those black folk did not like that press about him and those little girls. And then also he had done a lot of magazine spreads and newspaper spreads where, you know, he had 50 suits, you know, and this is at a time when black men couldn't afford one suit. Then you got all of these exotic cars. So some of the lower class or poorer black people, some of them were somewhat jealous of him. Then you had the higher dignified black people where they felt like he was an embarrassment because they felt he acted nigger rich. Because of the black people looked at him like that, it really made his vaudeville or theater career, it, it just didn't go as well as planned. Since this tide had started turning against him, a lot of people started to kind of speak out about his character where people started to say, well, we're kind of embarrassed by the character he plays. We all black folks don't act like that, don't look like like that you know and instead of Lincoln Perry just letting it go by not responding when these newspaper clippings would come out his behind sitting up there acting like Donald Trump sitting up there responding to every single thing somebody says like sir you're in a higher position why are you responding to this little person from Montana you know but Lincoln Perry could not help it whenever he saw a newspaper where it was somebody kind of downing him or downing his character he would get on the phone with that newspaper editor and go slap off and be like, hey, you print this response. When people saw these responses, that made it even worse. So then they would double down and then Lincoln got so fed up with it that one time he called for an interview with a local newspaper and he got in there and he spilled some words that he should have never said. And I can't tell you the whole thing, but the gist of what he was saying is, why are y'all always talking about what black people think? Like, I don't care what these black folks think. They're not even the majority of my audience. White people make up 90% of my audience anyway, so who cares what the black folks think? Hmm. Baby, you think black Twitter doing something today? Hold on it. After that man said that stuff, them black folks' response back then was long and loud, honey. I mean, it turned into hatred for a lot of black people for him. And this is one of the things that truly, truly sealed his film career for that first half. You know what I'm saying? They already kind of threw him out and things like that. But anybody who was thinking about pulling him back in, oh, that sealed it. And when Lincoln Perry realized that all the doors to Hollywood were now shut to him, he started started acting even worse. There was one time, I think he was on the same bill with Ethel Waters or something like that, but he went on there, he didn't perform his show, he just stood there talking to the audience about his failed film career. He was drinking and then after it said, he laid down and went to sleep in the middle of the stage. People tried to get him off the stage. They tried to tell him, we got other acts to follow you. You know, he was like, y'all leave me alone. And then there was this story that got put out how he had to perform at a theater and while he was backstage getting ready to go on, he had ordered a steak from a restaurant that was downtown and close to the theater and so the delivery man is like that'll be two dollars and pop bust upside the head once again child lincoln is mad because they did not bring him any steak sauce and this time not only does lincoln jump on this guy his whole entourage starts to beat this boy up but lincoln gets dragged to court and once he does he tells a totally completely different story the story he tells is that once the delivery man gets to the theater he pulls out his steak you know lincoln pulls out his steak and he starts to put steak sauce on it and while he's putting steak sauce on the steak the delivery boy actually busts him upside the head. I don't know. I'm sorry, this is funny though. But the delivery boy actually bust him upside the head because the delivery boy said, you don't disrespect our steaks like that. The restaurant I work for, they cook steaks to perfection. So yes, I'm ready to fight you because you putting steak sauce on our perfect steak. And so when the judge or the lawyer or whoever was like, if that's the true story, then where did the delivery boy get all these bruises and stuff from? Lincoln goes on to say that he heard when the delivery boy got back to the restaurant, the manager actually jumped on him. The people in the restaurant jumped on the delivery boy because they found out that he had left the steak sauce out of the bag. Y'all, I know, that whole thing was confusing and it sounded stupid and it really sounded stupid because I truly believe that Lincoln Perry was just telling a lie. There's this one story about how his valet or his chauffeur, he attacked him and bust him upside the head with an alarm clock because he said that the chauffeur made him late to a show. One of the positive things that had happened for him though is that his wife did give birth to a son and this son was called Jimma Joe. And Jimma Joe stands for Jesus, Mary, and Joseph put together. But by the time Jimma Joe was like one, two, or maybe even three years old, Dorothy was ready 
ready to divorce Lincoln. It's claimed that she showed up at a police station and they claim her jaw, nose, and chin was broken. And she said that Lincoln had beat her with his fist as well as a broomstick. In the end, it is claimed that Lincoln was let off of any of the charges, but they did get a divorce and his wife Dorothy took full custody of their son, Gemma Joe. After his divorce from Dorothy Stevenson, Lincoln got with yet another teenager. This girl's name was Winnie Johnson. And honey, listen, if he thought Dorothy Stevenson was a siren, then baby, he thought this Miss Winnie Johnson was a straight goddess. Because honey, the folks say that everybody knew that she was beautiful. They talked about her beauty for miles around. Winnie was his new boo thing and he went and showed her around just like everybody else and it is claimed that in October of 1937, they eloped. And soon after that, she also became pregnant with his son, Donald. And their relationship soured right after that. Lincoln said that he would take care of the child, but him and Winnie, they split up. Now by this time, Lincoln Perry had been out of the film industry for at least four years. He had lost his big fancy home he had lost all of his cars and that time when he was spending one thousand dollars per cashmere sweater all of that stuff was gone okay he didn't really have anything now he was just living in a little bitty shoddy apartment he was just driving a little ford car and a light came shining through somebody in hollywood decided to give him another chance and so they offered him a role and he did well in that role and then before you know it the role started coming back now, I do think at this time they were only paying him like $1,000 a week or maybe $1,500 a week, but that was much better than not being paid anything for real. And he was good. He had grown up. He was acting more like an adult. He wasn't shouting in folks' faces. He wasn't flashing all of that good stuff. But sooner or later, his old behavior came back in a big way and Hollywood started to feel like it was a big mistake to have him back. And what's worse, this was now the 1940s and black people as a whole, not just a few black people or the high class black people, black people as a whole were all starting to feel like those characters, that step and fetch it caricature or character was offensive. They didn't want to see that portrayed anymore. And again, instead of Lincoln Perry just letting it go and maybe seeing if it would blow over, he felt like it was his duty to defend himself and mostly defend his character. And again, he called for an interview with the paper and in this interview, he said something to the the effect of you white people that's agreeing with all these black people that's saying that step and fetch is racist and you guys supporting these changes for black people and stuff like that y'all better watch out y'all better watch out because what's going to happen when you do give these black folks equality what's going to happen when you give them all this money and put them on your level what you think gonna happen baby i can tell you the first thing that's gonna happen is they're gonna turn against you and why wouldn't they all the stuff that they blame you for and just saying stuff like that the worst decisions that he could have made in his life he was actively making those decisions why are you saying that sir that right there sealed one of the final nails in his coffin for real and then if things Things couldn't get any worse something did get worse. This was news about Winnie Johnson. So when Lincoln and Winnie eloped, they ran around and did a whole bunch of magazine interviews and you know, talking to everybody, saying that they were now husband and wife, okay? And like I said, they had that baby and then they split up. Well, since then, Lincoln, although he said that he would help take care of that child, he never did help take care of this child, okay? So Winnie is feeling like she's under pressure. So she goes to the press and she tells the press that Step and Fetch it, aka Lincoln Perry is not taking care of his responsibilities we have the son together he won't give me any money and so lincoln perry instead of being hush mouth and paying her whatever money he owed he turns around and he says well why don't you winnie tell the news about how we were never married Tell him about how I used you as an entertainment ploy and how I just wanted to get more press. Tell him that. And she was like, okay, you know, I admit it. We were never married. He does tell the truth about that. But that is his son. And Lincoln is like, you know, how is that my son when we were never married? And, you know, it's probably somebody else's child. The worst thing he could have done. Once again, this press turned very bad against him because once again, it looked like that you're using these teenage girls. You forced her to play like y'all were married. Then you got her pregnant and then you abandon her and turn around and say that that's not your child. He was ruining himself and he was pointing fingers
happens to everybody else. And I think he did it because he imagined himself to be the Lincoln Perry of early 1920s. He imagined himself to be this big hot shot of Hollywood where, you know, they would take his side and everybody would look at this girl like she was nothing. But people did not look at it like that. They looked at it like you're trying to now ruin this girl's career and her reputation after you have gotten her pregnant just because you don't want to take care of your child. By the time the 50s uh, civil rights movement came along in the 60s and stuff like that, Lincoln Perry found himself very, very broke. And the only thing that he was doing was what he had been doing for years, making newspaper clippings about people talking bad about him and picking up the phone and defending himself. Except this time, they were not only talking bad about him, they also were talking bad about Hattie McDaniel and everybody else who had to do stuff at that time. And it's claimed that not only did this make Lincoln Perry mad, it actually really and truly broke his heart to sit up there and see men like Harry Belafonte or men like Sidney Poitier say these kind of little slick things and stuff like that when he felt like he was the one that kicked the door open for them to even come through and do that. He felt like he had to go through the fire just so they could come up and have a chance. And he felt like that it was very disrespectful and he just, his feelings were hurt. And honestly, y'all, truly, if he would have probably just said that, and left it alone, people might have started feeling sorry for him. There's no telling what might have would have happened for him at this time. But instead, he also doubled down on being angry and vindictive at the new upcoming blacks. So he felt like he had to get back at them. They were saying all this stuff about him. He needed to say something about them. And baby, he started talking about all of them, child. I'm talking about, he was even talking about civil rights leaders. He said that the civil rights movement was a joke. He started talking about Martin Luther King. He talked about Dick Gregory. He was so mad that he even started to talk down and talk against liberal white people. He started to say, you know, all y'all want to do is keep black folks in a bad position anyway. Y'all pacifying these black people instead of letting them know that they need to get out and work for their living. You know, stuff like that. So he was saying all this, but he was screwing himself in the process because one of the main things he wanted to do was get back into Hollywood. This is not the same Hollywood as 1930s, not even 1940s. The studio heads and directors that were around in that time period have now died or they have now retired. These new up and coming directors and studio heads were white liberals, a lot of them, and they did not take kindly to the stuff he was saying against them. So he was really, really screwing himself every which way, y'all. And then finally he shut his mouth for a little while just a little while, okay? And he started keeping to himself. And then the next time that people really saw Lincoln Perry is when he was hanging out with Muhammad Ali around the time that Ali fought Sonny Liston. And you know, when he was making a big name for himself, people had started to respect him a little bit more. They started to look at him, oh, you know, maybe he ain't just a white man's coon. You know what I'm saying? He hanging around with Ali. Ali ain't finna let no white man talk to him like, you know. So your name is back in the papers and it's in a good way. So Hollywood wants to capitalize on it. Hmm, maybe this old time star can bring us more money so he does get a call to do a pilot episode with the up-and-coming hot stuff comedian flip wilson and in this pilot episode you know i think that flip wilson played the son and lincoln perry played the father or something like that but whatever the case it is claimed that it was a very very good pilot episode but y'all the time it was horrible y'all before the pilot could even be reached out or sent to the director or studio head dbs put out a program and the program was basically about you know uh old race stars where are they now or you know things that conditions of black people in show business whatever i don't know the title of it but basically that's what it was saying on that program and one of the first lines that bill cosby said was hello everyone the tradition of the lazy, stupid, crapshooter, chicken-stealing idiot was popularized by Lincoln Perry. That cat made well over $2 million portraying black folks that way. Oh, y'all, it was so bad. It was terrible. Along with Bill Cosby and his opening lines, they showed all type of embarrassing pictures from way back in the 30s. They had video clips of Step and Fetcher scratching his head, you know, boss, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Had all that kind of stuff. It was plastered across the TV screen of millions, of millions, y'all. When Lincoln Perry saw this, that man could have balled himself up and died right then and there. Because do you believe that that studio was going to continue with what they were doing with him and Flip Wilson? They didn't give a dog on how good that pilot was. They couldn't chance it now. 
They cannot chance it because now what is seared in Americans' minds is Lincoln Perry playing step and fetch it and bringing the back race back by a hundred years. It was that close that close to making a comeback, or not even a comeback, just getting some money in his pocket because he was really destitute. As a matter of fact, he had gotten remarried in the 50s to a new wife and they were not living well at all. They were living in a small apartment and gossip says that the pain went so deep in Lincoln Perry that he dropped all chances of a comeback. He dropped it all these years he had fought, he had worked, he had tried to turn his image around where he could play a straight man. He did want to play serious roles, you know, he even tried to pitch a movie of Satchel Paige where he wanted to star as Satchel Paige. So he did try, y'all. He did try. And so it was like he had finally maneuvered his career into somebody taking him at least a little bit serious. And it was gone. It was all blown out the water. He did try to sue CBS for like messing up his name, you know what I'm saying? And also for messing up his future money and stuff like that, but the case was dropped. Hey guys, I need to cut in right here because the video got deleted somehow, but Step and Fetch's life at this point is going horribly. Everything is going downhill for him and things didn't seem like they could get any worse, but baby, let me tell you, they certainly did. That next year, in the year of 1969, his son Donald, the one he had by Winnie Johnson, the one that he had denied that time, snapped. Donald had been upset with the plight of black people. He was tired of the way black people were treated, and he was sick of white folks. And so he sought to take revenge. And what he did was take a gun and drive down the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and he killed four people and wounded 16 others. And gossip claims that there was no warning signs or that anybody knew. You know, I think Donald had kind of withdrawn to himself, so nobody really knew about it. And with this happening, things could have went very, very bad for Lincoln Perry. His name could have been in the dirt once and for all. But fortunately, when they showed up at his door and he was asked about it, he was very decent. He no longer denied Donald. He told the public straight up that yes, Donald was my son and I am so sorry to the victims. I apologize. I cannot tell you what happened. You know, I hadn't really talked to my son, but yes, that is my son. And it's because he responded this way instead of lashing out or instead of still denying his son people who gained a lot of respect for him you know so that made it to where in his elderly years he started getting things like a few tributes and some people inducted him into certain halls so things sort of looked up for him but honestly what he truly wanted in his heart was to become a well-respected veteran actor and to possibly get back into show business and these things were harder to attain than just certain tributes and things like that unfortunately and since that was the case he felt very strongly about defending his time in show business about defending step and fetch it so he continued to cut out his little newspaper clippings and call every news station anytime somebody says something bad about him and his character as a matter of fact it is said that he was doing just that when he suffered a massive stroke that the stroke was so violent that it actually broke his jaw after suffering this stroke he did move back home with his wife but she was elderly too by this time because unlike the other folks when he married her she was not a teenager okay so he had actually got with a woman so she had aged right along with him and so like i said she was elderly too at this time so she couldn't really keep up his care like that so he ended up moving into a nursing home in hollywood and before long lincoln's wife had to move into this nursing home with him because she was not feeling as well either and it said that when she went into this nursing home she would make sure that her husband's clothes was laid out that morning she would iron them and stuff like that and go sit by his bedside just to be abused and not only was she being abused he was abusing everybody because in his mind these people worked for him he felt himself you know i am a big star or i was a big star and y'all need to do what i say he still had that about him in a way but it is claimed that towards the end he started to notice that there was nobody truly there for him but his wife you know he loved his wife his wife loved him and then she ended up passing away and Lincoln Perry heartbroken and alone passed away two months later the date was November 19th 1985 and he died of pneumonia and congestive heart failure and this is the end of the old Hollywood scandals y'all please go ahead and like this video I've told y'all that that does make a difference so please please like this video also please subscribe it would help me out a whole lot love you guys I will see you guys soon with a new video bye